Good afternoon. We're here again from Partick, Free Church of Scotland, continuing. And it's a privilege to be able to come out this afternoon with the Christian Gospel. We're glad you're able to join with us in our open-air witness outside Partick Station in the West End of Glasgow. And as you pass by, we hope and trust that you'll be able to hear something that might benefit your souls. For we want to present something of the authentic Christian gospel to you. And there will be one or two persons out and about who are handing out uh, gospel tracts. And we would be very happy if you would receive a tract. And maybe you can't read it at the moment, but no doubt you'll have some time later on that you may be able to read it and read something more concerning uh, this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we said, we're from Partick, Free Church of Scotland, continuing. We are a, a local congregation. We, our building is at Two Thornwood Terrace. That's just up Dumbarton Road. You will come to the police station first, and then opposite the police station, go up the hill there, and you will first come to Thornwood Primary School, and you will then see our building next door at the crossroads. And we would give you all a warm welcome to come along. We meet every Lord's Day, uh, that Sunday at 11 a.m., and again in the early evening at 6 p.m. And we also have a, a midweek meeting where we meet at 7.30 p.m. And you are warmly welcome to attend any or all of these services. Now, why are we here? Well, we are here because we don't tell nice stories. We preach from the Word of God, which is the Bible, the Holy Bible, the only holy book that's in the world. There's no other book like this book. Why? Because it has come to us from God Himself. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may, may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And therefore, we come and we seek to preach what's in the Bible. Now, we might ask ourselves then, what is in the Bible? What is the Bible all about? Maybe you've read one or two things in the Bible and perhaps you have been confused by what you have read, and you would readily admit that you did not understand it. Well, the Bible is a book about God's activity, what God has done, and particularly what God has done in and through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the Bible is a record of what God has done. And the way back at the very beginning, what do we find in the first book of the Bible? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And there, right at the very beginning, what do we find? We find God's activity. What's it telling us? It's telling us that God is the one who made heaven and the earth. And right away, surely this is telling us that the God of the Bible, the God with whom we have to do, is a God who is eternal. He is before the whole of creation. He was there right at the beginning. Why? Because He brought about the beginning. And therefore, this tells us that the God with whom you have to do with, and the God that we proclaim to you who reveals Himself in the Word of God is eternal. That means He has 
no beginning and he will have no end. And that means that we cannot erase God out of our lives or out of existence, no matter how hard we might try. And indeed, today in this world that we live in, many people are wanting to get rid of God. Oh yes, my dear, that is true. Many people want to erase God. And any, any mention of God or any mention of His Word or any mention of the Gospel, as far as the public life of Scotland is concerned, people do not want to hear about God. And somehow they might think that they can erase God or God is in some sense irrelevant. Uh huh. Right. Oh well, that's contrary to the word of God. That's for sure. Same-sex marriage is not approved. It is an abomination. But. Of course, my dear. Oh, but there's such a thing as false love. Oh, no. Yes, of course, it's a, it is an abomination. The Bible says that, and we believe it. No, no, it's even older than that. Aye, but that. Does that not show you how up to date the Bible is when it's talking about an issue that's, uh, that is contemporary today? Oh, well, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to preach about it because I want to proclaim to you today the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. What is the Bible talking about there? In Colossians, in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, well, it's talking about the Son of God. Earlier, before I started speaking to this lady here, we began to tell you that God is the one who has created heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But in the New Testament, friends, what do we find? We find that creation is attributed to none other than the Son of God Himself. In fact, the creation is a work of the Trinity. The Father is involved in it, the Son is involved in it, and the Holy Spirit is involved in it. The triune God have been involved in the creation of heaven and earth. Do you have a Bible? Yes, dear. Here. I don't have one. Oh, I beg your pardon. Yes, I have a New Testament. Yes, bear with me just a moment. Just bear with me. There's one in my case here. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you You're welcome. Please read it. I will. Thank you. <coughs> We're delighted to be able to uh, hand out uh, a Bible. And if you want a Bible at some time, please make yourself known. I might not be able to give it to you right away, but we would be happy to pass one on to you in due course. And friends, we're here today because the Bible testifies about what God has done. And it all revolves around a person. The Old Testament was written preparing the way for the coming of the Son of God. And the New Testament tells us of the coming of the Son of God. And the epistles tell us about the, the churches that were formed and how the, the gospel spread out from Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, 
and then ultimately to the ends of the earth, so that after a few centuries, the Roman Empire began to officially recognize Christianity as its official religion. And therefore, when we pick up our Bibles and when we, when we, when we read it, we are to see Christ in the Bible. We are to see the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ when we come to read our Bibles. As I said, the Old Testament is a period in the history of this world when the world is being prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And the New Testament fulfills that promise because in the New Testament we have the incarnation, the birth, the life, the teachings, the miracles, and the sufferings, and the death, and the resurrection, and the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the Bible might be regarded as the God's working in mankind. Now, we want to ask ourselves a question. It's good to ask ourselves a question. It's good to ponder these things. And the first question we want to ask ourselves this afternoon is, why did the Lord Jesus Christ come to this world? Put it another way. Why did the Son of God become just like us? Or why did the Son of God leave the happiness and the holiness and the peace and the blessedness of heaven and come to this world? What was his purpose? Did he have a, a mission? Well, we're glad to say that he did have a mission. And more than that, not only did he have a mission, but he successfully carried out that mission. What was that mission? That mission, friends, as him, he himself did say, was to come and to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And therefore, all mankind must know that the Son of God became the Son of Man in order that he might save. And who did he come to save? Oh, here we come to the critical point in the Christian gospel. He came to save sinners. Is that not marvelous? Is that not wonderful? Is that not encouraging for us today to consider that the Son of God would leave the realms of glory and come to this world, suffer, and die in order that he might save sinners. Now, who are the sinners? Or who are sinners? Well, friends, the Bible does not flatter us here. The Bible is a book that speaks clearly and plainly. It tells us the truth. We might not like to be confronted with the truth, but it tells us the truth in order that we might be informed, in order that we might be educated, and in order that we might take appropriate action. What does the Bible say about us? It says this, and you can read it in the Bible for yourself. Don't take this simply from me. Pick up your own Bibles and read it. But it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For there is no difference... For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Here the Apostle Paul was writing to the Romans. He had never seen the Roman Christians. He was writing to them in order that he might introduce himself to them in anticipation of going to visit them and that they might know the gospel that he proclaims. And he's stating out his argument and he comes to this conclusion. And it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter how well educated we might be. 
And it doesn't matter how influential we are. It doesn't matter about our bank, bank balance. It doesn't matter about our upbringing. It doesn't matter about our occupation or any other thing that matters in this world. Here he says, For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every one of us, all here at Partick Station, all who might be hearing and listening in the flats, all in the shops, all in the station, all on the trains, all on the buses, every one of us, young, old, male, female, it doesn't matter the color of our skin, here's the Bible's verdict upon you and upon me. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now that might not trouble you. That might not bother you, I admit. But that's only because you don't realize the consequences. First of all, when we consider this statement, we must realize it's God's verdict. It's not my verdict. It's not the verdict of the church. It is the verdict of God. And who is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. God is an absolutely pure and holy God. And that would tell us that he cannot tolerate sin and will not tolerate sin. Sin is offensive to God. In the Old Testament, it is said of God, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. That's the God who made you. That's the God who formed you. That's the God to whom you are accountable unto. And this is God's verdict upon the whole of mankind. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there are consequences. The Apostle Paul goes on to say in the same letter in Romans chapter 6 and at verse 23, For the wages of sin is death. What a terrible thing to say. But that's the reality. For the wages of sin is death. If you are someone who is employed by another person, there'll come a time in the week or in the month or whenever when you look forward to getting your wages. Most people today have their wages paid directly into their bank accounts. And they look forward to that day when they will receive their wages. It may well be that they would like to have more wages. And maybe they might think to themselves, well, I'm worth more than this. I should be getting more money. I'm not getting enough. That's why we have some strikes going on at the moment, because people want higher wages, and they want better conditions. Well, sin has a wage. The wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says. And therefore, we are in some sense to be alarmed, and we are to take this thing seriously. We are not to dismiss this. God says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then he goes on to say in his word, for the wages of sin is death. Therefore, we must realize that sin is an extremely serious matter as far as God is concerned. And friends, whether we will acknowledge this or not, we must realize that in some sense, sin is a serious thing to us on a human level. Our whole lives are in some sense shaped by sin. What do I mean? 
Well, sin is the cause of all our problems in this world. Oh, that's a very broad statement, I acknowledge, but that is true. When you go back to the root of all our problems, it is because of sin. Why do we have sickness? Why do we have hospitals? Why do we need doctors? Why do we need nurses? Why do we have hospices? It's all because of sin. There would be no sick persons if there was no sin. You see, right at the very beginning, when God made the heaven and the earth, and when He created Adam and Eve, they were sinless. They were perfect. And the environment, and the world, and the universe was perfect. There was no sin, and therefore there was no problems, and there was no sickness. And because of sickness, friends, what has come? Sin, suffering, tears, death, wars, all of these things can ultimately be attributed to sin. This is a problem that we face every day. And whether we like it or not, the people with power and influence in our world today can do nothing about it. They can do nothing about it because of a number of reasons. But one reason is that they don't recognize the problem. Man's solution to the difficulties and the problems that sin brings to us is to pour money into it. Whereas God's solution to man's greatest problem is to deal with the problem itself, the very root of the problem, sin. And that's what he did when he sent forth his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. How can Christ possibly deal with our greatest problem? I hope that is a question that you're asking yourself. Here is a gospel minister with a Bible in his hand, and he's telling us we have a great problem and a problem that we cannot and will not and do not want to address ourselves, but God in Christ has dealt with the problem. And you might well be asking yourself, if you're thinking at all, what has Christ got to do with it? How can Christ indeed deal with this great problem? Well, the Son of God became the Son of Man. He came to this world. He took upon Himself our form and our nature. He became just like us. He lived a perfect life. He never sinned. He was the only person that never, ever sinned in thought or in word or in deed. And having lived a perfect life, he was rejected by his people, and he was then crucified on Calvary's tree. Now we might think, well, that's a waste of a good life. Well, in some sense it was, but in another, and in a, in a greater sense, it was Christ working out a salvation for us, for mankind. Why? Because He suffered in our room and place. He was able to offer up a perfect sacrifice. Having lived a perfect life, He was able to offer up a perfect sacrifice. You see, mankind had broken God's law. And as I said to you earlier, the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die, the Bible says. And that's what sin deserves. And that's why Christ had to die. He died as our substitute in our room and in our place. God was punishing him instead of others. And here, friends, is the relevance and the application of the gospel to us this afternoon. We are here, and we are small, and we are insignificant, and there's nothing important in us at all. But here we are, and what are we doing? 
We're telling you about another. We're telling you about the Son of God, the one who suffered and died in the room and the place of sinners. And if you will but believe upon him, you shall be saved. This is what God is doing in Christ. In the gospel today, we are calling you to come and to put your faith and your hope and your trust upon someone else. Someone else who has lived a perfect life. Someone else who has fully obeyed the law of God and paid the penalty for breaking God's law on your behalf. And the truth of the gospel is, if you will but believe upon him, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive eternal life. Your sins shall be forgiven. That is glorious. That is beyond our wildest expectations that someone should suffer and die in a room and in our place. Now, friends, it's all very well speaking about him. It's all very well proclaiming him. But at the end of the day, there's something that you must do. This is the work of God. What is the work of God? The work of God is to believe on him whom he hath sent. That's what's required of you. And we realize that you cannot possibly trust upon someone that you've never heard. If you've never heard about the Lord Jesus Christ, why would you possibly trust upon him? Well, that's why we come out this afternoon, that we might make him known, that you might call upon him, that you would receive him as Lord and Savior. We're going to take a short break, but we're here from Partick, Free Church of Scotland continuing, and we would ask that the Lord might bless his word to you this afternoon. Good afternoon. We're glad you're able to join with us on this afternoon. We're here from Partick, Free Church of Scotland, continuing. And we're a local congregation. We meet at 2 Thornwood Terrace, Upton Barton Road. You'll come to the police station, opposite the police station. Go up there, the hill. First of all, you'll come to Thornwood Primary School. We'll be on the crossroads next door to them. And we issue a warm welcome to every one of you to come along on the Lord's Day Sunday at 11 a.m. or in the early evening at 6 p.m. We also have a midweek meeting at Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. And we extend a warm welcome to you all. Come and make yourself known. We are a, a registered Scottish charity, and we do operate in the locality. We are not, in any sense, fly-by-night cowboys. We're not charlatans. We live in the community, and we simply have a desire to present the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ afresh to you this afternoon. I want to highlight a verse that we find in the Old Testament. It's a verse found in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 22. And with all these quotations, I would urge you to read your own Bibles. Go to the Bible yourself and find these things. Don't simply take my word for them. We uh, invite open inspection of the Bible. Christianity, it is said, was not done in a corner. We have nothing to hide. We're not a secret society. We have a gospel to proclaim, a person to recommend unto you, and we do not wish to hide anything from you. As it says in the Word of God, this thing was not done in a corner. And therefore, we invite inspection. Go to Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. 
for I am God and there is none else. First of all, we would notice that this is the prophet Isaiah speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he's not referring to himself. When he says, look unto me, he is not telling people to look unto himself, the prophet. No matter how good he was, he's not telling people to look unto himself. Because on another occasion he said, Woe is unto me. Why? Because he was a man of unclean lips. Therefore, he is not recommending himself. Who then is he recommending? He is recommending none other than the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who became the Son of Man. And it is a prophecy. It is looking to that day when the Son of God would come. And he says, Look unto me, and be ye saved. This is what we need. This is our greatest need. There is no greater need than this today, in that we be saved. Why do we need to be saved? We need to be saved, friends, because the Bible tells us that we are sinners. Now, this won't flatter us. It won't make us big-headed. In fact, it should humble us. But that's what it's designed to do. Look unto me, and be ye saved. Why? Because you need to be saved. And one day, this will become more real, and more pertinent, and more relevant to you than ever. Because one day, friends, you're going to meet God. You're going to meet Him face to face. The Bible says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Now that verse was written in Hebrews chapter 9, but it's really concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. In that chapter, the Apostle Paul is telling the people about the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that verse that I quoted is really talking about what Christ has done. It is appointed unto man once to die. It was appointed unto the Lord Jesus once to die. That's why he came. He came ultimately to die. He could never save us unless he died. What's the relevance? What's the connection? Well, the connection is that our sins deserve the punishment of death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And as I said earlier, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ suffered and died once. And after that, in some sense, he was judged. And on the third day, he rose victorious over the grave. And that would tell us that he passed the mark as far as judgment was concerned, we might say. But that verse has relevance to you and I today. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. You had no say when you came into this world. I don't need to tell you about biology, but you had no say when you came into this world. And friends, you will have no say when you depart from the scene of time. Because the Bible tells us it is appointed unto man once to die. Who has made that appointment? It is none other than God himself. He appointed your conception. He appointed your birth. And he will appoint your death. 
But what we want to extrapolate from this is the fact that when you die, you shall face judgment. Every one of us shall stand before Almighty God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And the Apostle Paul goes on to say, Therefore, or knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And friends, with all our faults, and with all our failings, and we have many, this is one reason why we come out this afternoon, afternoon, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing therefore there is a day of judgment. Knowing therefore that every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we will give account of ourselves, we come out in order that you might be made aware and in order that you might prepare for that day. Now, how can you possibly prepare for that day? Well, you don't need a lawyer or you don't need a king's counselor. You don't need some fancy law agent. What you need on that day is a Savior. And friends, you must get that Savior now. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now is the time to get right with God. Now is the time to seek the Lord Jesus Christ and be found in Him now, because this is the day of grace. This is the day of God's favor. I've mentioned to you the day of judgment. Well, when that day will come, it will not be a day of grace. The day of grace will end. It will be over. And in fact, your personal day of grace will end when you pass into eternity, as all of us will, unless the Lord shall return beforehand. And what you must realize is that today, here now, outside Partick Station on the west end of Glasgow, it is true today of you that you are on mercy's ground. What does that mean? God's mercy is upon you. The gospel is being proclaimed to you. You are being made aware of the brevity of life and the fact that there's going to be a day of judgment. And on that day, if you don't have a Savior, you will be condemned. And therefore, this is why we come out that we might be instrumental in bringing these matters to your consideration, that you would not dismiss the gospel, that you would not be like the Jews when they saw the Lord Jesus. What did they say? Crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. What, what was the very essence of their sin when they said, crucify him? What was the very essence of their crime? Their crime was that they rejected the Lord Jesus. Now, if you're here today and you're hearing the gospel and you are rejecting Christ, then you are no different from the Jews. Oh, you're not saying crucify him, crucify him. No, we acknowledge. But in essence, you're doing exactly the same. What did they do? They rejected the Lord Jesus. And we can do this today in the 21st century. But friends, to reject the Lord Jesus is to reject any hope of salvation. It is to reject any hope of being reconciled to God. It is to reject any hope of being in glory when we pass into eternity. 
because salvation is found in none other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, the one who came from heaven to seek and to save that which was lost. What did he say of himself? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. What is that telling us? It's telling us that the Lord Jesus is the only Savior, the only one that can reconcile us to God, the only one that can take us to heaven. That's what he's saying. When he says, no man cometh to the Father, what he's saying is, no one will get to heaven unless the Lord Jesus takes them. This is why Christianity is exclusive. It is dogmatic upon this matter. And therefore, this is why we discount all other religions. It doesn't matter their name. It doesn't matter what they claim. It doesn't matter their teachings. None of them can save. None. No church can save. No religion can save. Nothing but Jesus Christ. And therefore, if you're going to be saved, if you're going to have your sins forgiven, if you're going to be reconciled to God, something must happen. What must happen? You must come and believe upon the Lord Jesus. You must receive Him as your Lord and as your Savior. In other words, you must have dealings with Christ. This is important, therefore. We're not talking about a secondary issue. We're talking about your eternal destination. Where will you spend eternity? Friends, life is, what is it? Is very brief, is it not? Death is certain. Sin is the problem. And Christ, and Christ alone, is the cure. That's why we come out, tell you about him. Look unto me, the, the prophet Isaiah said, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. You know, our Savior is man, yes, but he's also God. He is absolutely unique. There is no other person like him in the whole of this universe. He is God the Son who became the God-man. And he did this in order that mankind might be saved. Do you realize that the angels were created perfect? Satan was once perfect. But he rebelled, along with, we believe, around a third of the angels. They rebelled against Almighty God. But do you know, they cannot be saved. It's impossible for angels to be saved. And those who sinned are being reserved for that final day of judgment when they shall be cast into hell itself. They cannot be saved. There is not a gospel for them. And one reason they cannot be saved is that the Lord Jesus Christ did not become like an angel. He became a man. He became a man in order that mankind would be saved. He became just like us. Why? Because mankind fell, and mankind needed a Savior. And that Savior was the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became the Son of Man. 
Now this is very, very important for us. We cannot dismiss this. We must indeed proclaim this. As the, the prophet says, look unto me. You are to look unto the Lord Jesus Christ and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. That means everyone. Why everyone? Because we're all sinners. It doesn't matter what country we come from. It doesn't matter the color of our skin. It doesn't matter the language that we speak. We're all sinners. Why? Because we've all come from one set of parents. Who are they? They are Adam and Eve. And they are the ones who sinned, and we have sinned in them. <coughs> Therefore, that's why it says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. There is no other Savior, no other person coming, no other gospel for you. This is why you must, you must hear this gospel, and you must respond to this gospel, and you must call upon the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have a great warrant to come. We have a great warrant to come. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The Bible tells us there is no God like our God, who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. That's the God of the Bible. Who is like him? Who would forgive sins? Only in the Lord Jesus Christ, because he delighteth in mercy. And we are to seek this God. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Therefore we have a great incentive. We're not to let our sins stop us from coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. No. Instead we are to repent, and we are to believe the gospel. That's what's required of us. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. That's talking about repentance. And this is what is required of us. We must turn away from our sins. As we said earlier, there is none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners in the sight of God. Therefore, that's why God says, God commands all men everywhere to repent. And we are to repent. We're to turn away from our sins. We're to turn away from our sins of fornication, or adultery, or stealing, or lying, or idolatry, or lying and cheating, or homosexuality. Whatever it is, we're to turn away from it. And God commands us in the gospel to repent and to believe the gospel. And that's why we seek to come out this afternoon, that we might impress upon you something of the gospel and the glorious claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You know, sometimes we might think that the God is out to condemn us. No. God will condemn on that day. That's for certain. But at the moment, it is the day of grace. And this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And the Apostle Paul goes on to say, of whom I am the chief. That's quite remarkable when you think he was the most exercised Christian 
the world has ever known. But when he wrote this, he said, of whom I am the chief. He recognized that even as a Christian, even as a godly Christian, he was nothing more than the chief of sinners. And surely this is to encourage us that we might come to the Lord Jesus Christ and that we might call upon him while he is near. We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland continuing. We're going to take a short break in the hope that the rain might pass. But may God bless his word to you this afternoon.